to Deflate Gate. Deflate Gate. Fort Saga, known as Deflate Gate. Now to that bombshell NFL report on Deflate Gate. I think I heard it all at this point. The media finds this story to be uh, irresistible. Would not say that I'm Mona Lisa Vito of the football world. This sort of Deflate Gate controversy. <laughs> it felt any different. Uh, the power you wield uh, in the process. Goodell, head of a cartel, taking advantage of his position of power and manipulating the media. The NFL didn't adequately consider the role of temperature with the football's air pressures. Deflategate once monopolized the news cycles with an assortment of misinformation that is still frequently repeated to this day. In this video, we're going to relive parts of the Wells report and the endless flaws within it. We'll show how fake leaks fed to the media affected the entire nation's viewpoint, and we'll dive into the science with deflated balls in every cold weather game there ever was. I'm gonna warn you ahead of time, this video is very thorough and goes into a lot of details, some of which you may may not necessarily care about, but I wanted to include as much information as I could. Can't say everything is here, but there's a lot. Hopefully this video can be a little bit of a teaching point for some people. It's so much easier to just read a few headlines and form an opinion rather than dive deep into something and sort through the lies being spread by certain parts of the media. Those lies came from a series of masterful moves pulled off by the NFL in both legal language language and narrative building that in return diluted the entire country. So to believe in Deflategate, you have to ignore the fact that there is no evidence of a scheme to deflate footballs. You have to ignore the science behind the weather and what it would do to the footballs. You have to ignore that the NFL was caught lying several times throughout this entire circus. You have to ignore that the only time PSI, or pounds per square inch, was mentioned in text amongst Patriots employees was on a comment on 13 PSI, being the target for Patriots equipment staffers, which is right in the middle of the league's range. You have to ignore that the NFL had every text from the Patriots equipment staff and coaches, and you have to ignore that Roger Goodell had the ultimate power under the collective bargaining agreement to do whatever he would like. In this video, I'm going to defend all of those claims. As always, all reports will be sourced in the description, so feel free to check those out if you'd like to learn more. Ironically, it was an ESPN writer who put all this so eloquently. Kevin Seifert said, In the league's zeal to preserve the perception of credible outcomes, the NFL scandalized itself with an investigation that produced far more suspicion, ill will, and accusations of impropriety than the original allegations themselves. As we begin, we first must learn how Deflategate came to be. It all started with Colts general manager Ryan Grigson sending an email to the NFL League office the day before the AFC Championship game, which took place on January 18th, 2015. Grigson didn't ask the league to make sure the balls met regulation standards before the game. Instead, he suggested that the game balls used by the Patriots be checked as the game goes on. So on the rainy 48 degree evening, the officials measured the PSI in footballs during the halftime break for the first time in the entire 95 year history of the NFL. Never before had the league measured the PSI of a football during or after a game. There was no history of data. Before every game, the balls are measured to fit in the range 12.5 to 13.5 PSI. Before the AFC Championship, the Patriots footballs passed inspection at 12.5 or 12.6 PSI in the 72 degree officials locker room. Unfortunately, there's just about no chance the referee's rushed attempt at halftime to measure the balls would come close to standing up to scientific scrutiny. First off, they had two gauges which were coming in with different numbers. They also measured the Patriots balls first, giving the Colts balls extra minutes in the warm air, which allows the molecules to expand and give a higher PSI reading. 
Yet again, something that would not survive scientific scrutiny and effectively destroys any value gained from this data. If you remember the ideal gas law from science class, temperature is a key variable. When temperature goes down, so does the ball pressure. If you live in a place with cold winters, then you've probably had a low tire pressure warning on your car on some of the coldest days of the year. So yes, the Patriots balls were now coming in below regulation. But because the officials took so long with the Patriots balls, they ran out of time, measuring only 4 out of the 12 Colts balls, giving us a smaller sample size and less useful account of data. But even then, 3 of the 4 calculated Colts balls, which started at 13 psi before the game, measured below regulation at halftime. Still, there was a question as to why the Patriots balls lost more PSI. And once again, the league failed to account for other things as well. Like the Patriots ball boys didn't use trash bags to cover the balls from the rain like the Colts did. The Patriots were also on offense more often than the Colts in that half. And except for Andrew Luck taking a knee, New England had the ball for the final 17 real-time minutes of the half. A ball that is more wet would take longer to warm up, once back inside the official's locker room. When you account for this, along with the Colts balls being measured with several more minutes in the warm air, then it explains any difference in lost PSI. Worth noting, the Patriots also scored 17 in the first half, then the refs switched out the balls at halftime for new ones, and guess what? The Patriots scored 28 in the second half. Colts tight end Dwayne Allen said, They could have played with soap for balls and beat us. Two weeks later in the Super Bowl, Brady threw four touchdowns against one of the best defenses of all time, and with deflate gate in full motion, you can bet the NFL pumped those balls a bit extra. Anyway, this controversy stirred up by the Colts in the league quickly became a battle of deception versus science. A report about deflated footballs during a cold blowout would have remained a footnote until ESPN's Chris Mortensen reported a factually incorrect piece on the Patriots footballs. He said that 11 out of 12 Patriots footballs were underinflated by at least 2 pounds. This was a lie, but why would Mortensen risk destroying his reputation over something as specific as that? It had to come from a seemingly reliable source. And you sure would think so with that number being reportedly leaked by the NFL's Executive Vice President of Football Operations, Troy Vinson. Yeah, the same Troy Vinson who told the Bills and Bengals to warm up just moments after the terrifying DeMar Hamlin injury. One team official involved in that Bills-Bengals game said Vincent will never take accountability. That's him to a T. It shouldn't surprise anyone that Vincent denied and according to this team official lied to the public about resuming play. Both Joe Buck and the ESPN Deportes announcer were given information from the league about resuming play. That all leads back to Vincent and Roger Goodell. They will both be key figures in the Deflategate drama. Anyway, Mortensen ended up walking back on his word. Well, sort of. He said the report was incorrect, but did so very quietly and left his original tweet up for a good while. Either way, the damage had been done. Vincent's false leak was all that was needed for most people to make up their minds on the guilty party. And of course, the NFL didn't leak any details on the Colts balls also showing up as under NFL regulation. News stations ran with the report and failed to realize that Mortensen had quietly walked back on it. Fans across the country who probably already hated the Patriots to begin with were fueled with gasoline to pour on that fire. And the whole deflated football narrative became a common joke used across the country for the next few years, whether it be on late night talk shows or at the family Thanksgiving turkey bowl, which all in return reaffirmed the cheating bias. It didn't help that it took over an entire year for ESPN to add a clarification about the error to the original story. ESPN's public editor even said, To those looking for a smoking gun around some kind of ESPN-NFL collection,
collaboration in impugning the Patriots? I don't have it. But that doesn't mean you're crazy for wondering whether something was afoot. Another ESPN editor said it's been our lack of transparency and accountability with the Mortensen report that's been our biggest mistake in the reporting of Deflategate. So yes, even ESPN employees were shocked and frustrated by the lack of transparency and all-around sketchiness surrounding everything that had to do with Deflategate. It gets even worse when you consider the $2 billion a year relationship ESPN has with the league. I guess it shouldn't come as a shock that the NFL won once again was caught with egg on its face with the Bills Bengals warm up demand and yet again tried to throw ESPN under the bus thinking they would once again bend over backwards for the league but this time Joe Buck came out publicly with his reputation on the line and refused to back the lies that the league was spewing. So back to 2015 with the scandal in full force, the NFL hires none other than Ted Wells as an independent investigator. The the league paid Wells millions to conduct this investigation. His law firm had also defended the NFL during the concussion settlement. The vast majority of the media took Wells' word like he was an independent judge. But really, he was hired to tell the league what it wanted to hear. And to make matters worse, the NFL's top lawyer, Jeff Pash, was allowed to make final edits on the entire report. This wouldn't be the only fishy situation with the NFL. Later, the league rejected the Patriots' proposal to measure the PSI levels in the balls for every game during the 2015 season. Instead, they opted to do random spot checks that year and then refused to publish the results of those checks. And still, it gets even worse. The referees were supposed to be the ones doing those spot checks, but instead, every time it happened, NFL security took over the job, leaving the officials in the dark about any data. And then Roger Goodell came came out after the 2015 season and said that the data wasn't even kept by the league. Ironically, days after Goodell said that, the league's vice president of officiating back then, Dean Blandino, led the cat out of the bag, saying the league was still evaluating the data. Later, it was reported that Jeff Pash ordered the numbers to be deleted from their records. Blandino himself also comes off as suspicious though, with him lying to the press about not knowing about the Colts request to investigate the footballs before the AFC Championship. Unfortunately for him in the league, emails were released showing Blandino not only knew about the process that would be taking place, but also instructed referee Walt Anderson on following certain protocols. And things got even more suspect when Walt Anderson was eventually promoted to senior vice president, who directly reports to, guess who, Troy Vincent, the man who originally leaked the fake PSI numbers. But even with the numerous cover-ups, this matter would always come back to the science. So how would the league step around that issue? In the Wells report, the NFL hired a company of its choosing called Exponent as a hired gun to conduct a deflate gate experiment. But how could anyone trust the data coming from one of the two sides in this dispute? A side that had shown time and time again that it was willing to lie to get its way. This company itself has an embarrassing history of dishonesty and is quite frankly an insult to anyone who's ever taken a high school science class. In the past, Exponent has argued that secondhand smoke does not lead to cancer after being hired by Big Tobacco. Then there was the study that found that dumping oil waste in the Ecuadorian rainforest did not increase cancer rates. Guess who commissioned that study? Chevron. They were also hired by Exxon in 1989 after the Valdez oil spill. It seems any time a billion dollar corporation messes up big time, then they know it's time to bring in Exponent to conduct a study full of corner cutting in an attempt to fool people under the guise of science. Assumptions were made by Exponent from information given to them by the NFL's lawyers. One of these flawed assumptions came from using the Colts balls as a control group measured at the beginning of halftime with identical moisture levels. 
We know that the Colts balls were measured at the end of halftime and were kept under trash bags to keep them more dry. Also worth noting that the NFL refused to release their communications with Exponent and the full interviews with the referees. They said that the communications with Exponent were protected by lawyer-client confidentiality, which makes no sense when the NFL is also arguing that Exponent was supposed to be an independent group. The 2003 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, Roderick McKinnon, said if the officials used the one gauge to test the balls pre-game and at halftime, then you observe that the average Patriots ball pressure drops precisely in the range predicted by the ideal gas law when you account for the temperature differences. A Pittsburgh research company conducted an experiment aiming to mirror the weather and field conditions of the game. They found that those two factors alone were enough to explain the drop in ball pressure. We found that just from weather alone, meaning the colder air pressure and the fact that the footballs were wet, dropped the pressure inside the footballs to an average of 1.8 PSI. That 1.8 PSI is more than the average PSI loss from the Patriots ball measurements. Michael Naughton, chairman of the physics department at Boston College, who is a lifelong Bills fan, said, There is no question that temperature affects pressure, and every football on every football field in history has lost pressure when brought from a warm place to a cooler one. MIT physics professor David Pritchard called the NFL's case of Deflategate a ridiculous charade. And finally, an independent team of 21 professors from all over the country submitted a report out of professional conviction that scientific principles be explained and put to fair use. In that report, they said there is no scientific proof of wrongdoing. They even went as far as providing data for what would happen to a football with a starting PSI of 12.5 in 10,000 different NFL games. That red area Area is the area that would have survived the NFL's changing standards in January 2015. Troy Vincent testified that he had no idea that footballs were automatically going to lose pressure if it was cold outside compared to how warm it was inside. And in an admission of wrongdoing the next year during the Seahawks Vikings playoff game, the NFL decided to swap the balls at halftime over concerns of the balls dropping below 12.5 psi. Now, if for whatever reason you don't buy into the science, my next step would be demonstrating just how absurd the hysteria surrounding Deflategate got with examples of what other teams have done. First off, every team manipulates the footballs to their liking. Former Bengals quarterback Jeff Blake said he ordered ball boys to take the air out of footballs before every game of his career. He also started games for the Saints, Ravens, and Cardinals, but he said every team does it every game. Former Cardinals QB Matt Leinert said the same thing about every team doing it. Terry Bradshaw has spoken about how it was common practice when he played. Aaron Rodgers has admitted to going over the maximum amount of inflation allowed by the league because he likes the balls more inflated. A Jets equipment staff member was suspended by the NFL in 2009 for altering the kicking balls in an unapproved manner. In 2014, the Panthers were caught on camera illegally heating up balls in a game versus the Vikings. All they got was a warning from the NFL. In 2016, the Giants accused the Steelers of deflating footballs in the exact same way the Colts accused the Patriots. That was a December game. Plenty of other equipment violations in the past were either never caught or have been long forgotten. Joe Montana has admitted that his 49ers offensive linemen would spray silicone on their jerseys. Jerry Rice has also admitted to using stick em on his gloves. In the late 90s, Broncos offensive linemen covered them themselves in Vaseline. And ironically, the Colts have a murky past themselves. In 1999, offensive players were given hearing aids to hear Peyton Manning more clearly while playing in loud stadiums. And in 2007, the Colts were caught by the Patriots for pumping crowd noise into their own stadium while the Patriots were on offense. It's certainly not out of the 
realm of possibilities that a deflated football accusation was revenge for that. The Jaguars and Steelers have also previously accused the Colts of pumping crowd noise. More recently, the Chiefs, Lions, and Eagles were caught placing objects under footballs to aid field goal kicks. Yes, that happened this past year and you probably never heard about it. Basically, every team in the league has committed equipment violations, and if they didn't do something with equipment, then they've done something else. When it came to Deflategate, with the story revolving around the most famous NFL player ever on the most dominant team ever, this alleged equipment violation took on a life of its own. Unlike those other incidents, this one was treated with a full-fledged investigation. And the target in this investigation became the texts exchanged between two Patriots equipment staff members. The focus quickly concentrated on Jim McNally, a man who referred to himself as the deflator. From the outside looking in, a Patriots staff member calling himself the deflator sounds like all the evidence you'd need to prove Deflategate was real and shut down this video at this very second. But if you dive deeper into these texts about the deflator and the word deflate, you'd see there was never a single mention about any scheme to deflate a football. And there was never any mention about Tom Brady wanting the footballs to be below regulation. Jim McNally was a big guy trying to lose weight and sometimes another equipment staffer, John John Jastrzemski would bulk up and then cut, so the two would have conversations about gaining or losing weight. This can be seen in the text that says, deflate and give somebody that jacket. Now, this all sounds like a terrible excuse in hindsight, but these texts were sent months before Deflategate ever became a thing. It happened back in May 2014, not even during the NFL season. McNally also said, come on, help the deflator, in a conversation about Shoes. It had nothing to do with footballs. But in the NFL's appeal brief, they lied and said that the term was used repeatedly throughout the 2014 season, even though their own Wells report says it's only used once, and that was in May. So the only thing the evidence points to is a word two friends used to describe McNally's weight loss happening during a time when no football was being played. Still, it's quite a weird word choice, but inflate and deflate would be a common verb in an equipment staffer's vocabulary due to their job, so it's not quite as weird as someone like me or you using it. Unfortunately, the word itself was all that was needed for headlines to be written and for millions to form their opinion off of those headlines. You certainly can't blame people for being suspicious seeing a word like that, I was myself, but when you dig deeper, there's text dirt during the football season that actually contradict any scheme to deflate the footballs. After the Jets game during the 2014 season, McNally and Jastrzemski had a conversation about a ball coming in at 16 PSI. Jastrzemski also sent a text saying they're supposed to be 13 PSI. What's wild is that that was the only time anyone ever mentioned the pounds per square inch of a ball in a text. And finally, the NFL also had security footage of McNally going to the bathroom while having the bag of balls strapped to his shoulder before the AFC Championship. The main problem with people who point out how secretive this so-called bathroom mission was, is that McNally walked past several referees because he was in the official's locker room with them. Then he left with the balls and entered the bathroom, which was monitored by a camera and security personnel. He even walked past a league official, James Daniel, who was aware of the Colts PSI requests. Daniel looked at McNally and made no objection to him carrying the balls alone, because there was nothing unusual about McNally carrying the balls alone. Unfortunately, no one can prove what happened in the bathroom because we can't see it. We do know he was in there for a standard amount of time it would take a person to go to the bathroom, and once he brought the balls to the field, he had to stay there for the entire first half. We also know that the Patriots balls fell within the perfect range to be explained under the ideal gas law. So isn't it far, far more likely that they were deflated by the weather and not some quick bathroom break happening in front of NFL officials? If the science wasn't ignored by the league, then no one would have ever even known about this guy needing to pee before game time. 
This also makes you wonder why the NFL didn't insist on testimony from McNally as part of the Tom Brady appeal hearing. In the end, the two ball boys were suspended by the Patriots, which you would think shows guilt, but of course that firing came as a directive from the league. Later, the team asked the NFL to reinstate them. Now the investigation turns toward Tom Brady. First off, the NFL interviewed dozens of witnesses and no one ever said a single thing about Brady preferring his balls under regulation inflation. They could have asked his ex-teammates like receivers or backup quarterbacks who would have a good idea on the matter, but they didn't bother doing that. Now, one of the NFL's attempts at evidence was Brady giving McNally autographed footballs. But as you you could expect Brady often signs balls for team staffers, especially if they specifically ask for them. The next item would be Brady's phone. The NFL's lawyers specifically told Brady and his representatives that they would not need his cell phone. They said we are not seeking to take possession of his phone or to image its contents. Plus, the league already had the uncensored text between Brady and the equipment staffers, Bill Belichick, and any other member of the Patriots that wasn't part of the Players Association. So who else is there that is relevant to this story? Giselle? Is Brady not going to text anyone on the team about the footballs, but text his wife about the footballs? Originally, Brady's phone wasn't even an issue during the investigation. It didn't become a problem until later, when the NFL suddenly said Brady never turned over his phone and had it destroyed. So let me ask you a question. If your employer previously leaked lies about you that hurt your reputation, reputation, are you going to turn your phone over to them? Maybe you still would? because you'd say I got nothing to hide. My personal opinion is that Brady's phone did have stuff to hide. Brady is close with some of the world's most powerful people, billionaires and politicians. Plus, there would be numerous celebrities in there as well. Those people all have plenty of things to hide. There could have been reputation-destroying conversations on there that were never supposed to see the light of day. We've seen this with someone like John Gruden, who went from NFL coach to one email leak later, never being able to coach again. So I think the decision to get rid of that phone would have been an easy choice deflate gate or not. There likely was pressure from others to destroy it too. So once Brady and his lawyers got the okay from the NFL that it wouldn't be needed, the phone was gone. Brady said he destroyed some of his previous cell phones in the past to keep his life private. I guess it's also important to remember that things between Brady and his celebrity wife weren't always smooth sailing either. It's certainly a possibility that there were conversations back then between him and Giselle that they wouldn't want going public for their own family to see. We also know things weren't always smooth sailing between Brady and Belichick. There could have been things as simple as insults thrown toward Belichick and texts that would hurt their relationship and the team, or something as big as another NFL team tampering with Brady in an attempt to get him to leave the Patriots. Why am I giving all these possibilities with just circumstantial evidence? Because that's exactly what the NFL did. And when you look at Brady's emails that the league had, there's also stuff there that he wishes would have not been made public. Besides all this, once the NFL went back on their word and showed interest in the phone, Brady offered to give up his phone records to everyone he communicated with. In the end, it was Roger Goodell who said it was not practical to do so. And why was it not practical? because the league already had the text from the equipment staffers and coaches. Brady was so confident that the NFL had no real evidence against him that he testified under oath. And on top of that lack of evidence, we have proof in Brady's performances that any so-called deflation scheme never even affected his play. Like we said before, Brady scored more points in the second half with the inflated balls during the AFC Championship. He threw four touchdowns against the best defense of the decade. The very next game after Deflategate, post Deflategate, he also went on to win four total Super Bowls, a number that is either equal to or more than any other quarterback's entire 
career. Had he not been suspended, he would have won the MVP award in 2016, throwing for 28 touchdowns to just two interceptions and going 11-1. So that was taken from him, but he ended up winning Super Bowl MVP that year anyway. And if you want to get very technical with the ball handling responsibilities, the road team doesn't bring ball boys to away games. So any suspected scheme with McNally had to be done at home games only. From 2006, the year where the NFL first allowed teams to handle footballs before games, to 2014, the season of Deflategate, Brady's home and road splits are almost identical when it comes to passing yards and his touchdown interception ratio. So even if you don't believe anything in this video and want to believe there was a deflation scheme, then even then, it didn't actually affect Brady's performance. It would be incredibly stupid for Brady to risk his reputation when what he was alleged to be doing actually didn't help his performance at all. And the NFL's excuse for him refusing to cooperate as evidence against him gets even worse when the NFL has turned a blind eye to those same types of situations. In 2012, the Broncos accused the Chargers of using sticky substances on towels brought out by equipment managers. When pressed by the referees, the Chargers refused to give up the towels. The NFL fined the team, but the Chargers appealed and got it reversed. Basically, the entire problem with Deflategate was that a conclusion had been decided first, and then an investigation took place in an attempt to support that conclusion. There was no independent investigation. So why was Tom Brady still suspended without evidence? Well, the commissioner of the NFL was given unilateral power on discipline, and the NFL and NFL Players Association collected bargaining agreement signed in 2011. Back then, Goodell had the right to do whatever he wanted, and that meant suspending Brady without proper backings. Not only could Goodell pick whether or not there would be a punishment, but he also got to pick the punishment. That's why Brady's suspension was ultimately upheld by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. If you remember, originally, Brady's suspension was overturned by U.S. District Court Judge Richard Berman. Then the NFL argued that the science didn't matter, and that what did matter was that they had the right to issue whatever ruling and punishment they wanted. So the Second Circuit judges said Goodell had properly exercised his broad discretion under the collective bargaining agreement. It had nothing to do with science or evidence at that point. It was all about Goodell having the power under contract to do whatever he would like. Because based on precedent, this would be an equipment violation, which the Second Circuit's chief judge said to the NFL. That would mean that Goodell Goodell should have fined Brady just over $8,000 with no suspension. But with Goodell able to do whatever he wanted, there was nothing the NFLPA could do. And on top of that, the Patriots should have not been fined $1 million and docked a first and fourth round pick. That's where the witch hunt metaphor hits hard. Burned alive at the stake for suspicions and lies from a conclusion that was met before any fair investigations ever took place. Goodell's judge, jury, and execution control was a hot topic during the subsequent CBA negotiations in 2020, and his power was somewhat reduced in that agreement. When Drew Brees was asked to comment on Deflategate, he said, listen, I'm not going to trust any league-led investigation when it comes to anything because it's not transparent. At times, I feel like there's a desired conclusion or agenda that they have in mind and that prevents maybe the absolute truth from being told or the absolute facts from being presented. So why would Goodell and Vincent not only manufacture a controversy out of nothing, but also continue to lie about it and eventually eventually take it 10 steps too far and cover the whole thing up. Well, because for one, they more or less got away with the whole thing. Your average person isn't aware of 90% of the things said in this video. A lot of that has to do with the original made-up leaks provided to the media. The first report is generally what people are going to remember. Second off, due to the CBA, Goodell got to keep the suspension in place. Those two things are what the majority of the population will remember. But what is 
the motive for doing this in the first place? There are different theories you could look at. The League itself is a playground for some of the richest people in the world. And those rich and powerful people aren't used to losing. Goodell works for the owners and when the owners found a way to somehow explain, I'm putting that in quotes, why the Patriots had been beating on their team throughout this century, then they took it and ran with it. An anonymous owner even said there was a jealous hater relationship with the Patriots. One source told ESPN, Brady has won 77% of his games. In a league that is designed for parody, that's a no-no. It was easy for other teams' fans to buy into it because those fans also were hungry for an excuse as to why the Patriots were winning so often. And as a plus, it got everyone, and I mean everyone, talking about football. NFL Network received a massive boost in ratings with a 37% spike during the peak of Deflategate, which in the end put more money in the owner's pockets. To build off that, the NFL had been occasionally making the general news in the previous year or two, but it was all about the blunders the league office made when it came to domestic violence issues and the alarming concussion cover-up by the league, which had a movie starring Will Smith scheduled to be released that same year. A little cheating story took all the attention away from the real scandals. ESPN reported that some owners had considered dismissing Goodell after his Ray Rice blunder. One of those owners was Robert Kraft, who historically had been one of Goodell's biggest supporters. But before Deflategate took place, Kraft privately called Goodell very disappointing and said his people don't have a clue as to what they're doing. Other owners were pondering Goodell's future as well. So when it came time for a controversy, Goodell bent over backwards to appeal to the majority of owners who wanted Ted Wells on the case. ESPN's report also stated Goodell's willingness to take on the Patriots has helped him emerge in a stronger position with most of his billionaire bosses. Some owners, including Giants owner John Mara, had privately thanked Kraft for accepting the Deflategate penalties. So it's hard to come up with exactly why the league would continually lie about a story that they could have put away so easily. It all seems irrational. Maybe it was just time for a little bullying on the billionaire playground. Sure, all we have is circumstantial evidence to prove our motive, but then again, that's a stronger case than the NFL ever had for Deflategate itself. In the end, as they say, ball don't lie. Post Deflategate, Brady would be a Hall of Fame player himself, proving that on the field, none of this mattered anyway. This video took many, many hours to research, write, and edit. If you really enjoyed it and have some spare cash laying around, then any tips you send by hitting the super thanks button enables me to make more videos just like this one. If you don't have any spare cash, then worry not because hitting that subscribe button and turning on notifications helps me as well. As always, thank you for watching.